the pathophysiology of vascular disease. Vascular pathobiology or vascular pathophysiology is the study of the mechanisms behind vascular disease at a cellular level, which is dominated by atherosclerosis. This overview will address arteriosclerosis, including atherosclerosis and arterial sclerosis, as well as near intimal hyperplasia, ischemia reperfusion injury and aneurysmal degeneration. Atherosclerosis is not only the most prolific vascular disease process, but it is the leading cause of death in Western society, contributing to two of the top five mortalities, that is cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease. Atherosclerosis principally affects large and medium-sized arteries the aorta and its branches including coronaries, carotid, mesenteric and lower limb, but has a preponderance for occurring at branching sites, for example carotid bifurcation. Known risk factors for its development include male gender, advancing age, smoking, dyslipidemia, diabetes mellitus and hypertension. Atherosclerotic lesions may occur in isolation, but, as a rule, Atherosclerosis is a systemic disease affecting numerous arterial locations. Furthermore, an atherosclerotic lesion in one location, for example lower limbs serves as a surrogate marker for disease elsewhere for example coronary arteries. The histological lesion forms primarily within the tunica intima consisting of a nodular accumulation of soft, yellowish material within a harder plaque. It is composed of modified macrophages, foam cells, cholesterol crystals and particulate calcification. The pathophysiology is probably multifactorial, of which vessel injury and vascular leak are the most accepted and popular theories. Atherosclerosis is a chronic inflammatory response over many decades in response to the biologic effects of various risk factors. There is a localized response to injury resulting in an increased permeability within the arterial wall also referred to as vascular leak. Certain blood-borne cells, the macrophages and cholesterol-containing lipoproteins, low-density lipoprotein and very low-density lipoprotein, enter through the leaky endothelium and deposit within the subendothelial space, that is the site of disease development. The lipoproteins are further oxidized by endothelial cells and later taken up by macrophages via scavenger pathways. This process forms foam cells, which are pathognomonic of atherosclerosis. Over time there is a proliferation and accumulation of both endothelial cells and smooth muscle cells. This proliferation results in extracellular matrix production and extracellular matrix accumulation. A fibrous cap forms. Eventually calcification of the plaque and the arterial wall takes place. Plaques may lead to blood flow limitation, often referred to as a stenosis. Plaques may complicate by rupturing. A plaque rupture could lead to acute thrombosis due to the release of prothrombotic material from within the plaque core. first take a look at atherosclerosis. So the blood vessel endothelium is made up of a single layer of cells and does two jobs. First it protects the rest of the blood vessel wall from the blood, like a coat of varnish on your wood furniture. And then secondly it secretes proteins on its surface to prevent the blood from clotting, because blood just inherently likes to clot whenever it gets the chance. Now your endothelium can become damaged in a lot of ways. 
Low-density lipoproteins, chemicals from smoking cigarettes, and high blood pressure all wreak havoc on the endothelium because these irritants break down the endothelium. The damaged endothelium oh. allow low-density lipoproteins to enter the endothelial wall. White blood cells called monocytes follow the low-density lipoproteins and break them down through oxidation. Okay, so you might think that macrophages eating the embedded low-density lipoproteins is a good thing. But if there are a lot of low-density lipoproteins, then the macrophage will eat so much cholesterol that it can die. It basically eats itself to death. After it dies, it deposits itself under the damaged endothelium. So now we have a dead macrophage filled with low-density lipoproteins stuck in the damaged endothelium as well. These dead macrophages are called foam cells, and that's because some guy a while back looked at these things in a microscope and thought they looked like foam on the beach, hence the name. Also when the macrophage dies, it releases cytokines, which calls over more monocytes which come over and eat more low-density lipoprotein, inevitably dying while doing so. And thus this vicious cycle of gross overeating and massive fatalities has begun. As more and more of these foam cells build up, they form a lesion we call a fatty streak. Now the fatty streak is thrombogenic, meaning that blood can clot on it. Platelets begin to gather at the damaged endothelium and release platelet-derived growth factor, which in turn encourages the growth of smooth muscle cells. Now normally smooth muscle cells are supposed to stay within the middle layer of the blood vessel, the tunica media. The release of platelet-derived growth factor draws the media smooth muscle cells to the tunica intima, where they multiply. The growing smooth muscle secretes collagen, proteoglycans, and elastin fibrous cells that help form a wall around the fatty streak, preventing blood clotting. And we call this extracellular matrix wall a fibrous cap, and together both the fatty streak and the surrounding fibrous cap is called plaque. The presence of fatty streaks cause the underlying smooth muscle in the blood vessel wall to also start depositing calcium into the plaque, creating crystals. Normally calcium is deposited into the vessel wall by low density lipoproteins and is then removed by high density lipoproteins. The accumulation of plaque in the vessel messes up with the ability of the high density lipoproteins to remove calcium from the vessel, so a buildup of calcium occurs in the vessel wall and it crystallizes. Now remember calcium makes stuff hard, which is why your bones are full of calcium, right? So this deposit of calcium into the plaque is what stiffens the walls of the arteries. Now remember the word that describes the immune system getting involved with something is called inflammation. So atherosclerosis is an inflammatory disease. Now as an aside, the protein called C-reactive protein increases in the blood during an infection or when inflammation is occurring somewhere in the body. While an elevated C-reactive protein isn't specific enough to diagnose atherosclerosis, it can act as like a red flag that atherosclerosis might be occurring, especially if someone has atherosclerosis symptoms or other risk factors. From time to time, that fibrous cap can crack and expose the underlying thrombogenic foam cells to blood. And this can happen randomly, and when it does, Within moments, you can see a blood clot start to form within the already partially occluded artery, quickly leading to even less blood being able to flow by. After about 70% of the blood vessel is occluded from the plaque and the new overlying blood clot, cell injury and death begin in the areas that were relying on that blood flow. If blood flow is reduced in the coronary arteries, angina and myocardial infarctions can occur. Seriously occluded internal carotid and middle cerebral arteries lead to strokes and cerebral atrophy. An occluded superior mesenteric artery affects the small intestine, and an occluded popliteal artery can cause peripheral vascular ischemia, like gangrene or claudication, which is frequent leg cramping during exercise. Now the building up of plaque also weakens the artery walls, which means it can lead to aneurysms, which explains why atherosclerosis is a main cause of abdominal aortic aneurysms. Near-intimal hyperplasia is often also referred to as myelointimal hyperplasia. This is the vascular histological response to acute injury, for example surgery, angioplasty, stent insertion, initiated by endothelial injury or denudation. The response is proportional to the severity or the depth of injury, that is if the media is also involved.
Near intimal hyperplasia is the leading cause of vessel restenosis in both the medium and long term after vascular intervention, thereby complicating 30 to 50 percent of vascular treatments. Its peak effect occurs between two months, the acute phase, and two years, the chronic remodeling phase. After this time, there are chronic structural changes within the vessel, akin to atherosclerosis, with a similar risk of stenosis and plaque ulceration and rupture, leading to thrombosis. Histology The lesion is firm, pale, and homogeneous lying between the endothelium and media. The lesion consists of vascular smooth muscle cells, about 20%, along with the newly synthesized extracellular matrix, about 80%, with smaller amounts of fibroblasts, macrophages and lymphocytes. The lesion may be typically localized and focal or occasionally diffuse throughout the vessel, or graft. Pathophysiology After injury occurs, growth factors are released, which in turn activate the normally quiescent vascular smooth muscle cells in the media. Activated vascular smooth muscle cells then change phenotype to their mobile and proliferative type and migrate to the intimal layer. Here they undergo proliferation and hyperplasia. The result is synthesis and deposition of extracellular matrix proteins. Arteriosclerosis. This is a general term for sclerosis or hardening of the arteries and is broadly subdivided into two types. One. Arteriosclerosis obliterans. This is characterized by gradual fibrosis and calcification of the intima and media leading to stenosis and eventual obliteration, and it mostly affects the medium and large arteries of the lower extremities too. Medial calcific sclerosis, also called Monkeberg's arteriosclerosis, this is characterized by dystrophic calcification of the media without intimal involvement or luminal narrowing commonly affecting the extremities with advancing age. Arteriosclerosis, atherosclerosis, and arteriolosclerosis. Arteriosclerosis is a general umbrella term describing diseases where the wall of the artery becomes thicker, harder, and less elastic than normal. You can figure that out right from the name, arterio, which is Greek for artery, and sclerosis, which is Greek for hardening. Now the word arteriolosclerosis is any sort of hardening of small arteries in arterioles. This is also pretty easy to remember since the olo in the middle of the word indicates small arterioles. And then finally, atherosclerosis is the hardening of any artery, even though it's usually medium to large sized arteries, which is caused by the buildup of plaque. These plaques are called atheromatous plaques and happen in the innermost wall of the blood vessel, called the tunica intima or endothelium. Ischemia reperfusion injury. This phenomenon occurs after restoration of blood flow following a period of ischemia resulting in further tissue damage, due to the reperfusion, with both systemic and local effects. It is caused by the uncontrolled release of oxygen-free radicals and superoxide moieties, especially the oxidation of hypoxanthine, that are generated in response to tissue ischemia. Local effects, tissue edema and necrosis leading to compartment syndrome further potentiating the ischemia. Systemic effects, acidosis and hyperkalemia, due to the release of accumulated acid moieties and intracellular potassium, respectively, coagulopathy, due to prothrombotic necrotic tissue, and myoglobinuria, due to rhabdomyolysis resulting in increased myoglobin and creatine kinase and leading to acute kidney injury. Aneurysmal degeneration. 
This is a degenerative condition of the vessel wall perhaps due to abnormal metalloproteinase production and regulation. MMPs, especially MMP2 and MMP9 are thought to have enzymatic properties that degrade elastin, which in combination with years of increased wall stress leads to progressive vessel dilatation. Chronic inflammatory infiltrates, especially in smokers, including T cells, B cells, macrophages and plasma cells also occur, which in turn secrete cytokines that may activate MMPs. Although there appears to be an inflammatory aspect to aneurysm development, there is also a genetic and gender link that is poorly understood. Note the higher familial incidence especially among first-degree male relatives. Vascular and endovascular surgery at a glance was used as the primary source for this educational presentation.